The use of heat to control bleeding is not a new concept and dates back to prehistoric times, where heated stones were used to obtain hemostasis after injury. It wasn't until the 1920s when William Bovey and Harvey Cushing paired up to introduce the first electrosurgical generator for the use in neurosurgery. Nearly a century later, most surgeries involve the use of electrosurgery. However, many surgeons continue to operate without fully understanding how electrosurgical devices harness nature's laws of electricity. The following modules provide a fundamental overview of the basics of electrosurgery to ensure patient and surgeon safety in the operating room. It is not by any means exhaustive. We recommend familiarizing yourself with the educational instructions provided online by each of the device manufacturers to avoid injuries from improper use. In this way, we can prevent patient injury from happening. Understanding some basic physics is instrumental to understanding electrosurgery. First, let's talk about the circuit. The circuit is the pathway for the uninterrupted flow of electrons. Think of the Indy 500. The cars are the electrons, and the racetrack is the circuit that those electrons can run around. Current is the flow of electrons over time. Think of this as the speed of the cars through the racetrack. Current is measured in amperes. Impedance is synonymous with resistance and is the obstacle to the flow of current. Impedance is measured in ohms. Say part of the Indy 500 racetrack got covered in a ton of mud. That's going to increase impedance and make it harder for the cars to move. Voltage is the force pushing current through a given resistance and is measured in volts. Think of it as a farmer pushing a wheelbarrow through the same muddy road. The greater the farmer pushes the wheelbarrow, the higher the voltage. Now that we've reviewed some basic terminology, let's talk about one of the most common misconceptions in surgery. The word electrocautery. Many surgeons use the word electrocautery when they really mean electrosurgery. To understand these terms better, we need to first review direct versus alternating current. Direct current is the brainchild of Thomas Edison and is what we typically see in household batteries. In direct current, there is unidirectional flow of electrons. Nikola Tesla developed alternating current, or current that flows in two directions. The 1880s saw the war of currents where Edison and Tesla feuded over which electrical system would predominate. In the end, Tesla won out, and so alternating current is the predominant current we use for energy delivery today. A classic myth in the operating room is in the words we use to describe the energy needed to perform most operations. Electrocautery is the passive transfer of heat using direct current developed by Edison. You are more likely to see this used outside of the operating room setting. For example, when a farmer brands their cattle. Electrosurgery, on the other hand, is what we actually use in the OR and uses alternating current thanks to Tesla. It allows for the flow of electrons through a circuit. So, now that we've busted that myth, let's talk more about this electric current. Frequency is the number of cycles of one waveform that is repeated per second. In a standard household socket, the frequency is 60 Hz. Now, just like you wouldn't want to stick your finger into a socket and shock yourself, we wouldn't want to use this frequency on patients in the operating room either. Fortunately, we can manipulate the frequency of electricity by the use of an electrosurgical generator, or ESU, to get the exact frequency we want. But, how do we know what frequency we want? Muscle and nerve stimulation from an electrical circuit ceases at around 100 kilohertz, so we want to make sure we use a frequency higher than this in general, surgery usually occurs at higher frequencies to avoid electrocution, about 350 kilohertz, or 350,000 cycles per second. The electrosurgical unit converts the dangerous frequency coming out of the wall outlet to this much higher and safer frequency that we can use for patients. So, now let's talk about the electrosurgical circuit. There are two main circuits that we use in the OR, bipolar circuits and monopolar circuits. In monopolar circuits, electrons start at the electrosurgical unit or generator and travel to the active electrode, most commonly an electrosurgical pencil. The electrons then flow out of the pen through the patient and collect in the dispersive electrode. From there, they make their way back to the ESU. The dispersive electrode is a very important part of the monopolar circuit. This is how the current returns to the ESU and completes the circuit. An appropriately sized pad, either adult or pediatric, must be used to avoid inadvertent patient burns as this occurs. The larger the surface area of the return electrode, the better the current will get dispersed and the safer the current will be. 
Additionally, placement of the dispersive electrode over a well-vascularized muscular area close to the operative field and away from metal implants is key to avoid injury. You want to avoid placing the dispersive electrode over scar tissue and bony prominences as this can increase risk to the patient. If you place the pad too far away from the operative site, you make the circuit longer, which results in decreased tissue effect. To compensate, surgeons may increase the settings on the electrosurgical pencil, which increases risk to the patient. A safer alternative would be to move the dispersive electrode closer to the operating site and shorten the circuit. Bipolar is a second circuit we use in the operating room. In bipolar circuitry, electrons flow from the ESU to one jaw of the active electrode, courses through the tissue held between the jaws of the instrument, and then returns back to the ESU via the other jaw of the instrument. Because the circuit is completed through just the tip of the electrosurgical device, bipolar electrosurgery does not technically need a dispersive electrode pad. The most common example of this would be a bipolar vessel sealing device. Now that we've covered some basics, let's talk about how we can manipulate the electrosurgical current to produce the desired tissue effect. Many factors influence the final tissue effect, including the size of the electrode, the power, the type of tissue you're operating on, the presence of escar on the electrode, and most fundamentally, the waveform you choose. Let's talk about waveform first. We're all familiar with the blue and yellow buttons on a standard electrosurgical pencil. We refer to the blue as coag and the yellow as cut, but what do these actually mean? Here's the spectrum of waveforms, ranging from pure cut to pure coag. As you can see here, the cut current has a low voltage and a high frequency. The pure coag function has a low frequency and a high voltage. Another difference between cut and coag is the time the current is on. In pure cut, the current is on 100% of the time, versus for pure coag, the current is only on 6% of the time, meaning that the coag waveform is interrupted. Knowing the difference between cut and coag is important because it helps you obtain the right tissue effect. Tissue effect depends on two main factors, the waveform and whether or not the active electrode is in contact with the tissue. Let's start with the cut function without tissue contact. This produces tissue vaporization. We see rapid tissue division because the intense heat generated causes intracellular water to literally explode cells, producing steam or vapor. An important thing to remember about vaporization is that the steam quickly dissipates the excess heat, preventing it from dehydrating adjacent cells. This means that tissue vaporization causes the least thermal spread to nearby tissue. We recommend using vaporization when you're operating close to bowel or ureters where inadvertent thermal spread could cause damage. What if we were to continue to use the non-contact method but activate the blue coag button? This would result in fulguration, which is the charring and carbonization of superficial tissue. The interrupted nature of the coag waveform is key here. Given that the current is only on for 6% of the time, the tissue is time to cool between. This forms a coagulum on the tissue surface. So, using coag without tissue contact causes a superficial char on the tissue, which may be good for superficial oozing, but is not as helpful if you are looking to penetrate the tissue deeper. Let's take a look at an example. We will now demonstrate the difference in tissue effect between the cut versus coag current using chicken meat as an example. Here is the monopolar energy being applied to a piece of tissue using the cut current. The non-contact technique allows the current to arc to the adjacent tissue. With the cut current, you can see a deep tissue effect with minimal lateral thermal spread. This is because this high frequency, low voltage current is causing vaporization of the cells, releasing only steam into its immediate surrounding. This vaporization is also why we see more smoke created when using the cut function compared to coag in the OR. Here is the monopolar energy being applied to a piece of tissue using the coag current. Notice that unlike the cut current, the coag current on the other hand has a much more superficial tissue effect with the coagulum developing at the perimeter of the electrode. The electrode can sometimes even adhere to the tissue as the coagulum develops. Now, let's think about what happens when you make contact with the tissue. 
Using the coag or cut function in creating contact with the tissue results in desiccation. This is a deep tissue effect that dries out the cell, causing it to shrink. This also causes the protein bonds in the cell to break and reform haphazardly. There are two main scenarios we use desiccation in surgery. When we use bipolar devices and when you hold a bleeding vessel between your forceps and activate the cut or coag waveform. Let's think about these tissue effects in a real world scenario. Say you want to control bleeding from a fairly small vessel. You hold onto the vessel with forceps. Which button do you activate? A lot of people mistakenly believe that the coag button will cause the more effective burn, which is due to the fact that the high voltage of the coag waveform gives the satisfying audible pop and visible spark. But in fact, it's actually the yellow cut button that will give you the depth of penetration you want to fully get through the vessel and stop bleeding. In addition, because of the low voltage used in the cut function, there's less lateral thermal spread meaning it's a better waveform to use when you're nearby delicate structures like the ureter or bowel. That said, using cut doesn't mean you're totally immune to causing collateral damage via thermal spread. If you activate the cut button for too long, you produce more heat and thus more thermal spread. It's important to use any waveform for the least amount of time necessary. Current density is another important concept and is affected by the size and shape of your active electrode. Current density is just like what it sounds how dense the current is being delivered to the tissue. If you are using a needle tip electrosurgical pen, this may be very dense. If you're using a ball electrode, current is more spread out because the surface electrode is bigger. Let's take a look at another example. Here is an example of how current density impacts the effect on the tissue. Note that when a needle tip electrode is used, the effect is very concentrated and pronounced. However, when a large ball electrode is utilized, a lesser and more superficial tissue effect is seen. This is because the current is spread out over a large surface area. Current density is also important when we are considering how to directly couple instruments. Have you ever wondered why we use DeBakey forceps to control a bleeding vessel rather than smooth forceps or Russians? If we used a larger tooth forceps with more surface area, we get minimal tissue effect. This is because the current is spread out over a much larger surface area. However, if we were to hold the same tissue with a DeBakey forcep, which has a much more narrow tip, we get the desiccation of the vessel we want to see because the current is much more concentrated. Now here's another application of current density. Let's say you're applying energy to the tip of this pedicle. However, let's say you didn't notice that the proximal portion of the pedicle is much thinner. Even though we're applying energy at one end of the pedicle, the current immediately travels back to the dispersive electrode. Because part of that path becomes very narrow, the current concentrates much more densely and causes a greater tissue effect at that narrow pedicle. You can see how if there were bowel right next to this thinnest portion of the pedicle, this could result in an unintended injury. The type of tissue also matters. Skin and muscle are highly conductive and have low resistance, so you can use low power settings. Adipose tissue, on the other hand, has high resistance and poor conductivity, so you may notice diminished tissue effect. To maximize tissue effect, it's also important to remove visible eschar on the active electrode as it collects. The eschar produces an excessive amount of resistance and makes it harder for the current to travel to the target tissue, resulting in decreased tissue effect. Let's talk about your settings on the ESU. Once the instrument is inserted, you will see the generator controls appear on the touchscreen monitor. Each monopolar instrument will have a cut and coag setting. Below each setting, you will also see options of pure and spray. For cut current, there are two possible modes, the pure and blend mode. The pure mode provides a continuous waveform that is 100% on whereas the blend mode allows for a somewhat interrupted waveform that results in slower cutting with simultaneous hemostasis, a bit like the coag current. For coag, the three modes are soft, fulgurate, and spray. 
The soft mode desiccates tissue with deeper thermal penetration and is typically performed with a ball electrode. The fulgurate mode coagulates tissue by sparking from the active electrode through the air to the patient tissue. The spray mode delivers wider fulguration with a more shallow penetration. The number on the screen represents the power level, measured in watts. Remember, power equals current times voltage, so to increase power, you can either increase the current or voltage. Well, this is true, in the OR, you can really only increase voltage. Each ESU manufacturer has a set of recommended power settings for each type of organ being operated on, so it's useful to take a look at the manual to see where you should start. As a general rule, use the lowest possible power setting to achieve tissue effect. In electrosurgery, more is not more, and to strike a balance between safety and efficacy, you want to use the lowest possible settings to achieve your desired tissue effect. The REM, or Return Electrode Monitoring Icon, monitors the dispersive electrode to ensure that it remains in contact with the patient, providing a large surface area to disperse the returning current. The icon is green when the active electrode is safely in contact with the patient and red when the electrode starts to peel off. As you've probably seen in the OR, the ESU will stop the flow of current when the pad is not appropriately in contact with the patient. Let's take a moment to discuss the dangers of electrosurgery. While electrosurgical injuries are preventable, it is the surgeon's responsibility to understand the technology and use it safely. Let's talk about a few key opportunities to keep you and your patients safe. The active electrode is the most obvious source of an unintentional thermal injury. It's important to return active electrodes into holsters or pockets rather than placing them directly on paper drapes so they don't get inadvertently activated and burn the drape or the patient. It's important the dispersive electrode pad remains adherent to the patient throughout surgery. The REM on the dispersive electrode of modern ESUs senses when the electrode starts to peel off the patient's skin. When that happens, current flow is stopped and you'll hear a warning beep when you try to activate the electrosurgical pencil. The dispersive electrode needs to be reattached completely before the current flow and electrosurgery can restart. You can imagine that if part of the sticky electrode peels off the patient and the current did not stop, that current delivered is going to be more concentrated given the smaller surface area. There have been cases of burns at the site of return electrodes which went unnoticed until the end of the operation when surgical drapes were removed. Insulation failure occurs when the insulation on an active electrode becomes cracked or worn through frequent use. Excessively high voltages can also create holes in insulation, so it's important to use the lowest voltage possible. When the insulation is compromised, current spills to the sides of the instrument and may injure surrounding tissue. In a study of laparoscopic instruments used in GYN surgery, 13% of laparoscopic and 32% of robotic instruments had insulation failure. It's important to inspect reusable instruments prior to use to make sure there is no obvious signs of damage. Stray current is when the electrons take the path of least resistance to reach the ground. When the dispersive electrode is placed too far from the operating site, it makes the circuit unnecessarily long, giving the electrons more of an opportunity to stray through EKG leads or other surfaces. When operating in the pelvis, we typically place the dispersive electrode on the patient's thigh for this reason. This wouldn't be a good spot for someone operating on the head or neck. Let's take a look at another example of circuit length. The length of the electrosurgical circuit is another important consideration. Take a look at this light bulb, which is part of a small closed circuit. We have the power settings quite low here, but we can still see the light bulb light up because of the short length of the overall circuit. Now, if we change the circuit length, that is, increase the distance the electrons travel before reaching the target issue, the effect is diminished. In this example, you can't even see the light bulb light up. With a longer circuit, you have to increase your power settings significantly to be able to see the light bulb light up even a little bit. It's also important that the dispersive electrode is close to the target tissue so that the electrons have a short distance to travel as they return to the electrosurgical unit. This decreases the chance of any electrons straying to other areas of the patient's body. Direct coupling happens when you have an active electrode touching another conductor and current flows from one instrument to another. 
We sometimes use direct coupling intentionally, like when we touch the tip of an electrosurgical pencil to forceps to stop a vessel from bleeding. Direct coupling could be dangerous, however, if we were retracting the ureter with a small metal forcep and an active electrode came in contact with this forcep inadvertently. Capacitive coupling is a trickier electromagnetic phenomenon that can also result in unintended injury. This occurs when there are two insulated conductors and the current in one conductor induces a current in the adjacent conductor. For example, this can happen when you have two insulated laparoscopic monopolar instruments and the current running through the active instrument induces a current in the inactive and perhaps even unplugged instrument seen here on the right. Especially if a high voltage is being used, this induced current can arc onto the tissue in an unintended location next to the inactive instrument and complete the circuit to the patient's return electrode. Keep in mind that depending on where the instrument is laying next to, this could even cause an injury outside your field of vision. This can be a tricky concept. Let's take a deeper look. Here's an example of capacitive coupling. In this demonstration, we have two electrodes. Notice the one with the needle point electrode is not plugged in, but is in contact with the chicken. When you activate the monopolar device that is plugged into the electrosurgical unit on the left and bring it near, but not touching the unplugged electrode, you notice the unplugged electrode is burning the chicken. That's because when you have two insulated electrodes, the active electrode can induce a current in the inactive insulated electrode. The unplugged electrode is coupled to the active electrode given its proximity. Keeping laparoscopic instruments in sight and away from each other is a way to avoid accidental capacitive coupling and injury to surrounding structures in the OR. Ever wonder why they give you a plastic clip in an operating room to corral your instrument cords? You're trying to avoid consequences of current leak. In this example, the light bulb takes the place of a metal clamp that you might be tempted to use in the OR to manage stray cords. Even though the monopolar pencil isn't directly touching the light bulb, electrons are leaking from the circuit and light up the light bulb. In the operating room, this current leak could result in drapes catching fire and the patient getting burned. For patients with pacemakers, the surgical team should be aware of the type of pacemaker being used and read the manufacturer's instructions with regards to what should be done if electrosurgery is to be used. Someone familiar with the device should be available to perform any reprogramming if the device malfunctions, and the manufacturer's phone number should be readily available for technical support. We recommend making sure the patient has recently had their pacemaker interrogated to prevent any preoperative delays. Know whether the patient is pacemaker dependent. Is she able to maintain a stable rhythm on her own without the aid of the pacemaker? If so, the electromagnetic interference, EMI, caused by the monopolar electrosurgical device being used for her hysterectomy could interfere with the device's function, which could lead to asystole. If there is any doubt about whether the patient does depend on the pacemaker, the pacemaker may be placed into asynchronous mode with the device programmer or by placing a magnet over the pulse generator. Which way to go will depend on the type of device the patient has. When a pacemaker is in asynchronous mode, heart rate pacing will happen at a fixed rate and will ignore outside signals, such as those that could theoretically originate from the monopolar device. An implantable cardiac defibrillator, ICD, could interpret EMI from a monopolar instrument as a tachyarrhythmia, which could lead to inappropriate defibrillation. Make sure the device is reprogrammed or has a magnet placed over it during the surgery to prevent confusing the device. An option to limit the possibility of electromagnetic interference, or EMI, is to use bipolar devices. Remember, this is because the current only flows through the electrodes of the bipolar instrument tip, rather than the patient's body, when using bipolar energy. While these are general tips, to ensure safety, refer to the implanted cardiac devices manual before surgery. Now that we've covered some basic principles of electrosurgery and how to avoid injury in the operating room, you're ready to start working. Read the manufacturer's instructions to help you learn about and troubleshoot your surgical tools. Set yourself up for success. Make sure you can see all of your active electrodes in the operative field. Use holsters for your electrosurgical pencil and don't wrap cords around metal clamps to secure drapes or instruments. 
Finally, optimize your circuit rather than reflexively turning the power up if you're noticing the electrosurgical pencil is not achieving the desired tissue effect. Happy operating!